Oh, so please join me in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this morning that we can spend with you. We ask you to keep us present and focused on listening to your word and to grow from your word. In your son's name, amen. Now I'll ask the band to come and lead us in worship. Run. 
Um, our next song is a kid's song, uh, so can I invite the helpers to come up? For a lot of us, um, so it's called Boss of the Cross. So what the song is about is saying how Jesus is the boss of the cross. And the song is going to explain how Jesus is the boss of the cross by dying on the cross and being raised to life again. So we're going to learn this song together, um, adults and kids, because it's some really important um, truth that we should all know. So we have some actions that, we're going to, that I'm going to teach all of you. So if we go to the first, the second slide actually. Um, so it goes, boss of the cross is going to happen quite a lot in this song. So how we do boss of the cross is boss. That's going to be boss of the cross. We're going to use our arm to make a cross. So boss of the cross. Okay, and then bore the sin and the shame. <clears throat> That's what we do for bore the sin and the shame. And then when he suffered and bled, yep, doing a cross, and then, and lay down with the dead. And then, but the lamb who was slain. So we're going to do this. But the lamb who was slain and who rose up again is the hope of the lost. So we can't see anything. So cover your eyes. And then he's the boss of the cross okay so that's how the verse go we might do the chorus as well because it repeats twice and then this is pretty easy so sin didn't stain him death couldn't claim him because jesus has rose from the dead so he rose again and his boss of the cross i think that's enough for us to learn for today and so we're going to sing from the beginning so feel free to join in when you feel comfortable and if you know the song if you know the actions make sure you do sing extra loud and extra big actions from you guys all right let's get the band
Uh, thank you, Ben, for leading us in our worship. A pretty fun song at the end there. Um, so we're moving into a time of announcements now. Um, so there are a few important announcements I have to make today. Uh, first off, uh, it's Easter coming up uh, next week. So uh, some information about the Easter services. So there will be an Easter service on Friday. Uh, that will be at 10 a.m. There will be morning tea that will be served. That includes hot cross buns and uh, tea and also coffee. Um, the Kids Church team has also organized uh, a game for big children, old children, all children. Basically, um, it's a game for anyone that can join in and play together. Um, it's the egg and spoon game. Um, so that's 10 a.m. Friday, uh, coming this Friday. Uh, Sunday will be normal time for our service, so that will be at 11 a.m. Uh, the Kids Church team has also organized an Easter egg hunt um, as well, uh, and church lunch will also follow as usual. Uh, another announcement, so you might notice that uh, we have Angel in the chapel today, um, going around taking photos. Uh, essentially, we're just doing an update, sprucing up the church website with some new photos. So she'll be going around taking photos of us, so uh, give your best look and your model pose in front of her. Um, but if you're uncomfortable with having your photo taken and being uh, on our website, uh, please tell me or Angel, and uh, we'll make sure uh, to keep... Uh, to take note of that. Uh, last announcement, so we won't be having Q&A after the talk today. Um, we'll be having a mission sharing um, from Hung that will happen um, at the end of this service. Uh, please note to those who are uh, tuning in in the online stream that the stream will end uh, at the end of the talk um, as we'll be taking the sharing offline. Um, and that's all the announcements I have to make. Uh, now we'll be moving into a time of prayer. Uh, prayer is a way for us as God's people to be talking with him, um, to be raising up with him. Um, yeah, things are happening in our church and also around the world and for the missionaries that we are supporting. Uh, this week we'll be praying for Mike and Joyce, uh, missionaries that uh, we're supporting. They're currently serving in Sydney right now with OMF. Uh, we'll be also praying for our uh, short-term Taiwan mission team um, that has... Uh, recently uh, just arrived in Taiwan and are serving there. And we'll be also praying for today's service as well. So please bow your heads with me and let's pray together. God, our Father, and Lord over your people, we are humbled at your greatness, your Son who walked on this earth and spoke to us, broken people. We are all at the grace you have shown in Jesus. We are sorry for our weakness to sin and our actions that turn our backs against you. As you teach us what it means to show love, patience, and kindness, please transform us to take on these qualities. Father, we pray for Mike and Joyce, who currently serve in Sydney with OMF. Thank you for the opportunity you have given to Joyce to be able to teach at School Chapel and her talk on friendship recently. We pray for Mike in his role in managing and caring missionaries overseas with OMF, we ask that you equip Mike with the wisdom to navigate the different challenges that is presented with helping missionaries that are experiencing difficulties in the field. We pray for the training Mike is providing for Chinese Bible study leaders. May these leaders grow from the training series and be equipped to teach your word in Chinese. Father, we thank you for the Taiwan mission team. Thank you that you have brought this team safely into Taiwan. We ask you, Lord, to provide the rest that is needed for the team from this journey, and we pray for the packed schedule ahead. Please sustain this team with evangelistic opportunities and conversations with the locals um, and for growth for them. We give thanks for today's service. We pray for Hung, who speaks from your word to us. We pray for the message that we're about to receive, that the message can stick to our hearts and help us to learn more from you and your word. In your son's name, amen. That's the time of our reading. Uh, hi, everyone. Today we'll be reading from Revelation and John. The first passage is going to be from Revelation 1, 
verses 4 to 6. Uh, it's on page 859 of your church red cover Bible, so I'll give you a minute to flip there, and it should also be coming up on the screen behind me shortly. Uh, Revelation 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Uh, second passage is from John chapter 18. Um, and that one is on page 752 of the Red Cover Bibles. Um, so we'll be reading from verse 1 to 14 and then skipping ahead to verse 28 to 40. Uh, so John 18, verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, uh, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those who gave, you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. And we'll skip ahead to verse 28, and we'll be reading to the end of the chapter. Uh, John 18, verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned, Jews, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising.
Thank you, Lenox, for reading God's Word to us. Good morning. Salam sejahtera dalam nama Yesus. Greetings and peace in the name of Jesus. This is Pastor Hong speaking. It is so wonderful to be up here with brothers and sisters to worship the Lord on this day. We have come to taste that the Lord is good and we want to experience the abundant life that Jesus has promised us. We wait for Jesus to minister to us, to sense His presence and experience His grace this morning. I hope that each Sunday as you come to church, you will come with an anticipation of what God might do within us and amongst us. What will God teach us today? Who might come to trust Jesus this morning? And what answers to prayers might He give to all of us. Today, the Worldwide Church celebrates Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. In our meditations in the Gospel of John, we have gone a little bit ahead. We are on Thursday night, an early Friday morning. Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, fed the disciples bread and wine, unmasked Judas as the betrayer and then gave a final discourse to his disciples. In John 18, we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. This event in Gethsemane is important as it is recorded in all four Gospels. The other events that are of matching importance would be Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, which are all recorded in all the four Gospels. Gospels. As you can see from the slide, the Gethsemane event is recorded in all the four Gospels. John leaves out quite a bit on what Jesus and his disciples did in Gethsemane before his arrest. And I will take liberties to draw upon the other Gospels to help us in the context of the story in John chapter 18. In our text, we see Jesus leading his disciples out of the city to a garden called Gethsemane. Gethsemane is an olive orchard with its own olive press. Gethsemane means oil press. We can see on the slide, Gethsemane, day and night. To get to Gethsemane, Jesus had to leave the city of Jerusalem on the east side, cross the Kidron Valley, and then ascend the Mount of Olives. On the slopes of the Mount of Olives within an olive grove, was Gethsemane. It is still there today. And we see this um, Gethsemane in the daytime and at night. And the reason why I'm showing you at night but the slides, you know, it's not so clear is because the Jewish calendar follows the lunar calendar and at every Passover, there would be a full moon. So we know that when Jesus was in Gethsemane, that very night, it was during a full moon because it was the Passover. The stillness of that night was bathed in the gentle, glowing light of the moon, causing dancing shadows as Jesus and his disciples ascend the slopes to Gethsemane. At the entrance of Gethsemane, Jesus instructs the body of disciples to wait, to keep watch and pray, and then he leads Peter, James and John deeper into the garden. And as he walks with them, his mood is heavy with sorrow, he experiences the full weight of the burden that he's about to bear. In his sorrow, he tells his disciples to watch and pray. Jesus is going to pray, and he wants his disciples to pray in solidarity with him. Jesus then goes a little further, prostrates himself on the ground, and prays to his Father. Why did Jesus need to pray? because Jesus knew that going forward, there would be suffering and death for him. He's going to drink the cup of God's wrath. For as he carries the weight of the sins of the world, his father will turn his face from him. He wants to hear the voice of his father one last time to be sure that this is God's will for him. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet not as I will but as you will. So integrity with his father is most important. He wants to ensure that he's on the same page with his father. He's one with his father with regards to his mission. 
How did Jesus pray? Dr. Liu records for us the intensity of Jesus' prayers in Luke chapter 22, verses 44. Next slide, please. Luke chapter 22, verses 44. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And the author of Hebrews captures for us this occasion in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was hurt because of his reverence. Jesus is in deep anguish as he grapples with the will of God for his life. On three occasions, he goes back to check on his disciples and he finds them sleeping. He prods them to wake them up to pray, but each time they would fall asleep Again, while Jesus is praying, his disciples are sleeping. They are ignorant of the dangers ahead of them. Is it any wonder that when the soldiers came, all the disciples scattered out of fear? They were not prepared for any conflict. The disciples remind us of ourselves. We are so often in spiritual slumber. We are peacetime Christians who are not mobilized for spiritual conflicts. The sleeping disciples remind me of a story about sleeping and praying. And the story goes like this. A Christian pastor and a Christian cab driver died on the same day and arrived at the pearly gates. St. Peter met them and after checking that their names were recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, welcomed them into their eternal dwellings. They were brought to the same street which was paved with gold. And there was a cottage and there was a mansion adjacent to each other. The pastor thought that he would get the mansion, but to his surprise, he was introduced to the cottage as his eternal home. And then St. Peter walked across the street and gave the mansion to the cab driver. Feeling dissatisfied, he asked St. Peter the reason for the apparent injustice because while he was on earth, he had served the Lord as a pastor for many years. And St. Peter replied, Well, we look for fruitfulness. When you were preaching, all your parishioners were sleeping. But when the cab driver was driving, all his passengers were praying. <laughs> Indeed, it is nothing like danger to life and limb that will awaken us to prayer. Friends, I just wonder, are you in snooze mode? Do you find that your pastor's preaching is sleep-inducing? Pray for your pastor. <laughs> if so, Satan will leave you alone because you are no threat to his kingdom. But if you want to make your life count for Christ, then it's time to wake up and get mobilised. Pray to the Lord for a spiritual awakening and tell the Lord that you wish to gird up your spiritual armour. Now, Jesus prayed and God heard his prayers. His prayers. The will of God remained unchanged and Jesus would have to go to the cross. However, Jesus' prayers were not in vain because Jesus came out from the prayer session with clarity and conviction. There was now no more ambivalence but only fortitude. Communion with his father stilled his soul. The tears had turned to resolve and despondency to determination. Jesus was now more determined than ever to complete his mission. On that night, Jesus won a great victory. He chose to live by the long road of God's will rather than the shortcut offered by the devil. And this battle was won on the prayer ground of Gethsemane. Friends, have you ever wondered how you can become an overcomer in your struggles and sorrows? Your battle is not won on the ring, in, the, on, in the ring, but in the gym. It is not won on the tracks, but on the training ground. It is not won in the exam hall, but in your study. Because if you're not on the training ground, it will show up in the heat of the battle. In spiritual conflicts, it is the same. It is not won during the skirmish, but on our knees 
in prayer. Are you currently uncertain about the will of God for your life? Which course should I take for uni or TAFE? What kind of job should I choose? Whom should I marry? Bearing in mind that all my suitors are Christians. Go to Gethsemane and let the Lord settle it for you. Or do you see a Golgotha coming before you? A bad medical diagnosis? A severe financial commitment? Or you will serve with divorce papers? Then you will need to get down on your knees at Gethsemane in the face of the approaching darkness of Golgotha. Your time on your knees will help you gain the victory in your life. For the battle is won on the prayer ground of Gethsemane before it is ever won on the battlefield of Golgotha. In the big picture of the Bible, we see the story of two gardens. And these stories lead to two destinies. The first garden is the Garden of Eden. The first Adam was tempted. He failed. He fell and he failed, then led to our exile and estrangement. The second garden is the Garden of Gethsemane. The second Adam, Jesus, was also tempted, but he remained faithful and firm, and that led to our redemption and reconciliation. Friends, if you are living as the old Adam, Jesus invites you to Gethsemane to find your redemption and reconciliation in him, the second Adam. Who died for your sins. The quietness of the night is now disturbed by the ruffling sounds of scrubs being pushed aside and the stomping of Roman boots. Jesus sees the flickering light of the torches coming his way. Under the light of the full moon, he makes out the silhouette of the soldiers coming for him. In verse 3 of John chapter 18, the Greek word that is translated as detachment of soldiers also means a cohort of soldiers, coming from the Latin word cohors. Now, a cohort in the Roman army is one-tenth of a legion. In the formation of the Roman army, a legion is 6,000 soldiers, and a cohort is one-tenth of a legion, meaning 600 soldiers. So the religious authorities brought up up to 600 soldiers, Roman soldiers together with their temple police and other religious officials, to arrest Jesus. Why did they have to bring such a cohort to arrest Jesus? Because they were afraid of him. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had healed the sick. And the various attempts to arrest him had failed. And furthermore, they were afraid of how the crowds might react if Jesus were arrested in the open. So they bought over Judas Iscariot, who is now leading them to Jesus. Judas knew where Jesus was because Jesus had brought his disciples often to Gethsemane to pray. So the hour has come. There is no fear in Jesus, only a resolute stand and a commanding presence. We see Jesus taking the initiative in verse 4 by asking, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Jesus said, I am he. Look at verse 6. When his, Jesus said, I am he, they drew back, and fell to the ground. What Jesus said literally in Greek was ego eimi, which means I am. In the original, there is no he there. Right? So verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth replied, in verse 5 says, I am. And also in verse 8, Jesus answered, I told you that I am. Jesus had used this phrase before to reveal who he was. In John chapter 8, verse 58, when the Jews ridiculed Jesus for saying that Abraham had seen him, Jesus replied, Very assuredly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. The name I am hearkens back to the time of Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God introduced himself as, I am who I am. In declaring himself as the great I am, Jesus reveals his personhood. In fact, in the Gospel of John, 
Jesus reveals who I am was when he said, I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm the true wine. In declaring himself as the great I am, Jesus is saying that, here I am, verily God before you, with the fullness of divine authority and with the divine nature embodied in my person. Jesus' divine utterance is so powerful that we see the soldiers falling to the ground, overwhelmed and overpowered by the sheer force of his words. If you think this is an accident, wait till you see what happens when Jesus comes back again. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says this. You can see it, right? It's up there. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow. Hear this with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. What happened to these soldiers in Gethsemane is just a precursor of what will happen to the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, at the second coming of Jesus. When I read this verse, I think of Jesus as the ultimate MMA fighter and Tai Chi master. Jesus has Hei Gong Wan, you know. You know? By the sheer breath of his mouth, just by doing this, Jesus would overthrow the Antichrist and destroy him by his presence. For these soldiers lying on the ground, they are confronted by the masterful presence of Jesus. No arrest can be done except if Jesus allows it. So this is what happened. Jesus willingly allows himself to be arrested in John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, Jesus said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down in my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. So Jesus is marched away by the soldiers and in one single morning, he's subjected to six trials. Here are the trials in summary. If you look at your um, trials on the screen. There are three religious trials. One, Jesus before Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Two, Jesus before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. Three, Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Next slide. Then there are three civil trials. Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Jesus before Herod Antipas. Jesus back before Pontius Pilate. So we see Jesus having these six trials. Now, we don't have the time today to study the six trials in detail, but here are the, um, I'm just giving you a summary of what has happened. In the religious trials, Jesus was tried for blasphemy. But blasphemy was not a crime that is punishable in Roman law. That is why Pilate said to the religious leaders in verse 31 that they should take this man and judge him by their own law. However, the religious leaders wanted Jesus dead, so they had to find a capital crime that would stick on him. We see this in verse 31 but we have no right to execute anyone, they said. So this statement reveals their true intention. What they wanted was to have Jesus dead. The plot to execute Jesus was a self-serving decision to protect their privileged positions and to muzzle the truth that Jesus could very well be the Messiah because he could perform miracles and even raise the dead. These charges can be found in Luke chapter 23, verse 1. Right? Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah or King. So there were three charges that were brought against Jesus before Pilate, and that was subversion, a tax boycott, and insurrection, claiming that he is a king. Now, before we proceed with the interrogation by Pilate, we want to ask where Pilate stands in the whole scheme orchestrated by the religious leaders. We may think that it could have been any other governor, but according to the early church fathers, Pilate is a key personality in the trial of Jesus. Pilate is so important that his name in the church by the church fathers in the Apostles' Creed. What does the Apostles' Creed say? I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Do you know that Pontius Pilate is the only Gentile whose name is mentioned in the Apostles' Creed, which is the earliest creed of the Christian church? Pontius Pilate was a Gentile Roman governor. He is recorded in history as the Roman governor for Judea from AD 26 to AD 37. Having him preside over the trial of Jesus fulfilled Jesus' prediction of his own death. As Jesus travelled to Jerusalem, he predicted his own death three times. It is interesting to note that in the first two predictions, Jesus did not reveal the involvement of Gentiles. But at the third time, this is what Jesus said. We are going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he shall rise. So according to Jesus' prediction, it was necessary for representatives of both Jews and Gentiles to conspire against him. Pontius Pilate was the Gentile representative. He became the representative of the kingdom of this world against the representative of the kingdom of God. As Jesus stands before Pilate, here was the Son of God facing up to the representative of the kingdom of this world. In Pilate, we see how the kingdom of this world operates by force of arms, by soldiers, by horses and chariots, by taxes, by grand cities, by military alliances. The kingdom of this world flaunts its goal and glory, and very often it is very impressive to the naked eye. Pilate asked Jesus in verse 33, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate is sizing Jesus up to evaluate his influence and power. Are you a king? But you look pathetic. You have no money, no soldiers, no women. On what basis are you a king? And Jesus replies in verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate concedes, you are a king then. Jesus is a king. And he has a kingdom. But his kingdom is a different kind of kingdom than what Pilate is used to. The kingdom of Jesus is not of this world. That is why Jesus has no army to fight for him. The kingdom of Jesus is a spiritual kingdom and a heavenly one. The kingdom of Jesus marches to a different beat, fights a different battle, and are armed with different weapons. Jesus further explains in verse 37, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus says that his purpose in coming into this world is to testify to the truth. His kingdom is the kingdom of truth, and his reign is the reign of truth. The truth of Jesus is not constructed, nor is it developed, but it is revealed. He is the eternal word who became flesh and dwelt amongst us. For Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is a correspondence theory of truth where truth will correspond to reality. Our world has offered us different modes of interpreting our phenomenon by reason, by experience, or by tradition. While these modes may offer us some truth, Satan has so often corrupted all these modes by inserting counterfeit truths where sometimes half-truths are mixed with falsehoods. So how can we know authentic reality? 
when Jesus says he is the truth, he means that he is the revelation of all that we need to know about reality. Jesus tells us the truth about God, about ourselves, and about our world. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, that in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you want to know reality, then you will need to come to Jesus because Jesus is the revelation and the embodiment of all truth. That is why we read Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 just now because in that verse, it says that Jesus is the faithful witness. Jesus is faithful and his testimony is always reliable. This means that we can trust him. We can trust God's word. In Jesus, there are no appearances, no counterfeits, no lies, no falsehoods, no deceptions, no exaggerations, no sensationalizations, no pretensions, and no scams. Jesus is the center of epistemology and ontology. He helps me to know reality. And when I know the truth, the truth liberates me from false religions, false realities, and false values. For as Jesus stands before Pilate, it is truth standing before him. But Pilate could not see the truth and he asked, what is truth? But he does not wait for an answer, but goes back to the Jews and say to them in verse 18, I find no basis for a charge against this man. So deep down inside, Pilate believes that Jesus is innocent, but he lacked the fortitude to release him. Instead, he played appeasement politics. He tries to appease the crowd by offering an amnesty for a prisoner during the Passover and hoping that they would choose Christ. Well, Barabbas is here, but could you choose Christ to have to be released? So Pilate is not living by the truth, for if Jesus were innocent, why was there a need to make a choice? Just release him. Friends, I wish to end with verse 37. Jesus says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Are you tired of living a lie or listening to lies? Do you wish to be on the side of truth? Then Jesus invites you to come and listen to him. Will you ask Jesus to come into your life so that you can live in authentic reality? Jesus promises us, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus, who endured a great sorrow and triumph with a great victory at Gethsemane. Help us not to forget Gethsemane. In our struggles, may we go to the prayer ground of Gethsemane so that we may be ready for our battle at Golgotha. We pray that you will help us to discern falsehoods in whatever forms and forsake them in our hearts. Help us to be on the side of truth and listen to Jesus so that we might live in authentic reality. Lord, may you help us to live in the truth, for you promise that when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Thank you for our Lord Jesus. Thank you he came to be the faithful witness. Thank you, Lord, that we can read the Bible and trust you, because in your revelation, Lord, we can live by the truth and in reality. We want to praise you, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Um, please stand as we sing our reflection song together, uh, as we remember who uh, God is of the past, um, the present, and God of the future. Um, thank you, Ben, for leading us in response song, um, and thank you, Hung, for leading us uh, through that sermon. 
Um, I particularly enjoyed your analogy to um, the taxi driver and um, listening to the sermons. So, um, yeah, it could be relevant for some of us. Uh, but as a recap for what we just heard, um, yeah, uh, we're presented with um, Jesus who reveals before us. He declares himself as I am. He declares himself as the truth. And he, he gives us that truth to us. So, moving away from this week, um, yeah, I guess like the challenge for us is to think about if we're living our life in following his truth. And if not, uh, why not? And if we are following, if we have, if we are, if we have decided to follow his truth, are we preparing ourselves as well for the spiritual conflict? Um, so I will pray to close us off for this part of the service. So please join in me in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the message that we have heard today. Uh, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus, who reveals himself and declares the truth before us. I pray for us as we go about our weeks this week uh, that we can be dwelling and challenged by the word that we, and the message that we have heard today, that we are preparing ourselves through prayer with you and that we can be um, living with hope and joy and thankfulness. In the Son's name, amen. So thank you for those who have joined us in the stream this week. Uh, we'll see you again next week. And we'll be uh, closing this part 